today on The State of Us. What could peace in Ukraine look like? And would it really be good? Welcome to The State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined, of course, today by the one and only, the friendly redneck liberal and senior resident historian here at True Chat, Mr. Lance L. Jackson. So today we're going to look at the possibility of peace in Ukraine. In recent days, we've heard that Vladimir Putin and Vladimir Zelensky might be possibly meeting at some point to maybe talk about peace terms in Ukraine, a lot of ifs, what's, this, that's. Uh, But today what we're going to do is try to distill, is there actually a real path to peace? And then let's talk about, would that be the best thing? So there's a lot to get into, but before we get started, Lance, do we have a word of the day? We do. The word is capitulate. Mm. C-A-P-I-T-U-L-A-T-E. Four syllables, to give up or stop resisting. Also, to give up on prearranged conditions or surrender conditionally. As a noun, you can use the word capitulation, which is the act of capitulating. So I think that kind of fits. Who's going to blink? Who's going to make concessions and cause both sides to stop fighting or is that a pipe dream? And nobody's going to capitulate and the war will continue in some form or fashion. Whether or not some degree of capitulation will take place remains to be seen. But the main goal is to update you kind of on where things stand and talk about realistically, if there was going to be peace, what might be necessary on each side to accept. So uh, you may have heard about that potential meeting between the presidents, but then it sort of seemed like Russia maybe reversed course because uh, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov on Wednesday dispelled the idea that Tuesday's talks in Turkey between Ukrainian and Russian delegates had represented a turning point. Quote, no one said that the sides have made headway. He said he can't we can't point to anything particularly promising. Um, And that statement came less than 24 hours after Moscow's chief negotiator, Vladimir Mendinsky, said that Russian President Vladimir Putin agreed to meet his Ukrainian counterpart for the initially for the initialing of a peace treaty once the negotiations are completed. He also said that a show of goodwill, Russia would limit its operations near Kiev. Important to offset that all, Lance, with, right, people are very skeptical of whether or not any of that means anything because... Two things. It's possible that, number one, Russia is just merely rotating forces around Ukraine. Um, In other words, cycling in fresh troops, cycling out troops that have been there for a while, um, which, you know, can look like a a sign of goodwill because we're easing a little bit. Um, And that they may just be using this whole peace negotiating thing as a tactic to buy time um, to prepare for a second wave of the invasion to crush uh, the Ukrainians. So, of course, the answer is that Lance nor I actually know. Uh, it's also, in my opinion, Lance, probably what's going on, right, is it's some combination of both. In other words, uh, Russia is using this to their advantage um, in that if something maybe seems appetizing on the peace table or at least palatable, maybe they go for it. But they're not counting on that. And from a military standpoint, they're saying, you know, we can use this as an opportunity to maybe gain some strategic repositioning, some focus points. Um, The other component there of the military side, which I think is pointed out, right, is that all of this could just be a opportunity to strengthen the bargaining chips at the peace, quote unquote, peace negotiating table. Well, at the same time, the Russians are also attacking other regions than Kiev. And that is also a, a Russian, age old Russian tactic before negotiations, right? You do as much damage as possible. You try to take areas 
that you can control, that you can move forward on while you're negotiating to either A, force the negotiations or B, get what you want out of the negotiations. And I think a lot of it has to do with something that I've read in a couple places that you didn't mention, and that is an army travels with its supply lines. And it would appear to many Western analysts that there are problems with the Russian supply lines, that they are having trouble getting food and gasoline and uh, ammunition and the basic needs of a military um, to the forward troops. And so you mentioned stalling for time and opportunity. It's a chance to get your supply lines in order and get caught up so that you are now, when your soldiers are happier because they're eating three square meals a day, they have the petrol, the gasoline that they need to move forward. They have the ammunition and and those kinds of things. And so they're in a better mood. Plus, if you push your supply lines up and get them going, then if you make an advance deeper into the country, you don't falter again, like it seems like they did here. Kudos to the Ukrainians for using what they're getting and holding off, air quotes here, the mighty Russian army, at least for the time being. But as President Zelensky mentioned, this could change at any time. He said, we're, we're, we're holding on by, by a string here, folks. You know, yes, I'm glad everybody's proud of us and I'm glad for all the prayers and, and the help. But you guys have to understand, every day this goes on, it becomes harder and harder for us not to capitulate. I mean, we don't want to, but at some point we may not be able to, to hang on here. And again, to that point, is Putin really looking for peace talks? You know, when he thinks I can just, if the West isn't going to step up to the plate and support Ukraine in a stronger fashion, can the Ukrainians really stand up to me? I mean, how long will they last, right? I guess is th that's, I think, the other way of looking at it is a Putin may feel convinced that he can, in fact, just outlast them, right? So there's no need. Well, as long as he can stay in power, you know, and with that authoritarian right. regime, regime that he has, that's quite possible. But, you know, the sanctions are starting to hurt. But here's the other side. The Russian people historically have lived without, right? That's you know, World War II and the bread lines and, you know, well, it's okay, you know, in communism, I don't have anything, but I look at my neighbors, they don't have anything either. So we're all right because right. we're equal. None of us have anything. Um, so it's okay if we're all cold or we're all hot because we don't have electricity. We don't have lights. Okay. But how long we're starting to see cracks in the West, right? Towards keeping these sanctions because... Well, we need that oil. We need this power to generate. You know, the Germans have come out and said, well, you might get some gas rationing and some power rationing this summer uh, because we're just not going to have enough fuel to provide everything that our people need. And again, Putin sees that, reads that and says, well, my people can do without. So if we just keep going, they're going to start buying my oil again. If they buy my oil, then I'm hunky dory. Yeah, to your to your point about the what the the West is or is not doing. I mean, I think it continues to be important, right, to understand that. To Lance's point, the resolve of the Ukrainian people is probably the arguably the single biggest thing uh, that has delayed what may unfortunately be the inevitable if peace is not sought or if the West doesn't step up. Um, more. Now, I will say, um, I was a little surprised at some of President Biden's remarks, uh, when he was in Poland. Granted, uh, you know, it's not like he said that we're going to do a no-fly zone or troops on the ground or let them join NATO. None of that. I mean, nothing that shocking. Um, but I wasn't the only one that was surprised, evidently, because the White House uh, press team <laughs> right. sought to try to walk back some of his remarks immediately after he was done. They're like, ah, crap, Joe went off script again. Dang it. Um, we're We're really struggling with presidents here lately that can't seem to, you know, Read the <laughs> read the prepared remarks. And well, not, I've I've read the reasons yeah. and the rationale on why they're upset that he went off, yeah, you know, off script, as you say. But I daggone it, Joe, double down on it. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I appreciated that comment well, because he, that's what I've said three or four times, you know, here on, on this show when we do these episodes about what's going on in Ukraine. You know, I'm glad he got got up and, you know, the nerve and said, this guy's got to go. I mean, come on, people. Th this is horrible what he's done. He's broken all these rules. He's a war criminal. He's a butcher. All things the the president, I think, a war criminal, I'm not sure. I know he said butcher. You know, so to to stand up and say, this guy's got to go. Why are we backing off of that? Yeah. The, and, I, and I get it. And we can talk about it, you know, in the next segment about how, well, this is going to make Putin do this and do that. And, you know, long range, it doesn't get peace. And I, I guess I'm not one of those people, unless you can convince me in the next 25 minutes, that thinks that Putin wants any kind of peace without the total Ukraine. And more. Well, Biden said is, for God's sakes, this man cannot remain in power, which was an ad-libbed comment at the end of his speech. Um, and however, in his most recent address where he unveiled his 2023 budget, he said, it's ridiculous. Nobody believes that I was talking about taking down Putin. Nobody believes that. And I would argue, uh, no, I mean, I, I believe that's what you were saying. Uh, I believe that's what you were suggesting. And uh, I absolutely think that that's, you know, I, I am I am for that. However, uh, as as has been expressed, the the concern was that we might uh, anger Putin by doing that. And I guess my feeling is he's already angry. Good. Daggone it. There should be moral outrage. You should say something like that. And you should say, you know what, folks, this guy's causing it and we need to get rid of him because it's just going to continue as long as he's in power. That I could have respected. But to say it and then say, well, what I really meant was, daggone it, stand behind what you said. Because, yes, it was an emotional response, and it should be an emotional response. They're, you know, up to, they say what, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, 5 million refugees now maybe, and possibly up to 10 million that we don't even, you know, that, that, that they really can't even count so many. More, more than 4 million to flee Ukraine. We all think that that's okay, and we should just go back and buy oil from him so that the economies go well and everybody's happy and warm and as have long lights as gas and too expensive lands. That's, right. That's then, really all that matters. Right. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I, I guess you're right. I, I, I don't believe that, but unfortunately, yeah. yes. Yep. Put that, uh, put that Ukrainian flag on your, on your Facebook or your Twitter or whatever it might be. And then gripe about gas prices because, you know, Biden's evil and he sets the price of gas. So that's how, that's how the world works. So <laughs> I, I'm i sorry. I, I, I'm really not trying to be, uh, you know, a pain to to people because it is more uh, than that. But that it is a frustrating thing because I do hear people that say things like that. And it's, you know, and, and now we're upset because, right, because Biden says, well, I'm going to try to decrease, you know, these other countries dependency on Russia. So we're going to ship them you know, some of our fossil fuels. And then everybody's upset because, well, that means you're walking back, you know, your climate change needs. And it means, you know, so that's the Democrats are peeved about that. And then, you know, the uh, the Republicans, I guess, are upset that he's switching stances, even though that's what they want. I whatever. Because then I, now I'm a man of my word. I'm a, I'm a person of my word because I did what I said, even though I knew it was wrong. Right. I, I stayed well on track. <laughs> right. Really? That's what we want? Yeah. Those are the kind of we leaders? We don't want people who can admit that they need to change their position. Or, or right, because events changed. Events changed. Information changed. So now I'm going to change what I think we need to do. Isn't that called common sense? Oh, wait a minute. Not in today's political climate. If you do that, then you look down upon it. So we'll talk about some common sense here is what paths to peace might exist, who will have to capitulate, and if it's a good, if it's a quote unquote good compromise, right, everybody has to. The question is, is there really a good compromise? To find out, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. What could peace in Ukraine look like? Well, 
I guess one way that you know that it might be a successful compromise is that everything that's been laid out, I'm not a big fan of. Um, I'm not a, really a fan of any of it. However, I do see the you know, practicality of if the goal is to reach right an agreement, then as an article from the Washington Post outlines, it's titled, What a Russia-Ukraine Peace Deal Might Look Like, which, by the way, is linked at thestateofus.org, so you can look it up for yourself. It opens um, basically by saying, you know, can there really be a middle ground? The short answer is, it's possible, right? Well, good. I mean, we know that We've, I think we've already known that, is it possible? Sure. Is it possible? Yeah. Is it likely? Well, that's something that we'll answer here in a minute. Um, because there's really... Uh, well, and people have said and admitted it's more likely now than correct. it was two weeks ago. Exactly. So that makes it optimistic. But, you know... It's... The longer that Ukraine holds out, the more likely it is. Because, as you mentioned in the first segment, Lance, even though you've got an autocratic regime in Russia... Um, and even though most people capitulate to Putin inside his own country, there is a limit to what Russia and Putin's friends are going to tolerate, right? Uh, because as they're personally affected by what's happening, uh, it's, it's like Americans and the price of gasoline, right? Uh, obviously, uh, people don't like it when things hurt them in their everyday life. Um, they can stomach, you know, immorality if it's not directly affecting them. But then once it starts to hurt them, it's like, and why are we doing this again? What are we really going to get out of this? Um, so the reason that it's more likely, I think, is because as Ukraine holds out, Putin is more likely to say, I need to find something to claim as success. Um, because claiming nothing would be problematic. However, as we have been covering this now for several weeks straight, I would encourage you to go back and listen to some of the other things we've said, right, that clearly point out the the issue here of assuming that um, he would go for the peace route as opposed to all out, you know, annihilation or just overwhelming force. Well, that's where I was going because you were trying to make the case where it could happen. Well, why are we a little bit skeptical um, that either side will capitulate in this? One is neutrality. For Russia, this is the insistence on the Ukraine's neutrality, uh, meaning not to join the West, having no membership with NATO or the European Union. On the other side, for the Ukraine, any pledge of neutrality they would need Western security guarantees. This is the second sticking point. That is that the Ukraine, if they were to give up their ability to join NATO or the European Union, they would want a pledge from the Western nations acknowledged by Russia that Western powers would come to the aid if Kiev were threatened again. Now for Moscow, this is their stickiest point. So the idea of what Russia wants, and that is neutrality and what the Ukrainians want is a guarantee that this will never happen again are two of the main sticking points for each side. The third that we have to remember, as this article points out, there are regions that Vladimir Putin has already taken. And the war in Ukraine really started nearly a decade ago. And this issue over the Crimean Peninsula and taking over the areas of Luhansk and Donetsk in Ukraine's eastern Donbas, Donbas region are really what um, Putin wants, right? Putin said, I'm going to recognize the independence of these provinces because they're mostly Russian-speaking people, and it will give me a chance to uh, consolidate the gain of Crimea that I got five or six years ago. So other than those three things, they should be able to negotiate some peace. You know, I mean, as long as the Ukrainians give up their desire to join the West and Moscow promises never to attack what's left of Ukraine again, and Putin has the world acknowledge that Crimea belongs to him, um, then 
they could work something out. Is that all they have to do? So it's possible. <laughs> so well, those are only the main sticking points, right? Okay, oh, those those, okay. those are only the three big ones. Okay. So so as long as they can find some ground in there, uh, you know, <laughs> on which they some, might some give and take, they might agree on stand that, on the far edges of and right the, glare yeah, Putin, at one another. Mm-hmm. And you really believe that Putin won't attack again in the next twelve years? Right. Well, I'm not sure anybody believes that, right? But well, again, uh, are you willing to appease? Putin, I've used that word before here, to get the war to stop at the moment. And then how long before the Western countries cough in their hands and buy Russian oil? I just, sorry, just allowing that to to settle for people. I, I, and- right? I mean, we negotiate a peace. Oh, goodness, a great war is over. All the people can go back. Three months later, <clears throat> uh, uh, Russia, we'll, we'll buy that oil now. Yeah, thanks. Really, folks, that's how we defend democracies these days. I, I it's just, I, I just call it out because if and when it happens, maybe you can say you heard it here first, right? That you, we really think that we're going to keep and make life hard for Western Europeans and for ourselves to protect the people of Ukraine. I wish we would. I wish sanctions would stay in place, right? That would get Putin out of power. The people within Russia would say, you know what? You caused this, you, but do we have the stomach for that? Will we, uh, uh, you know, pay higher electric bills? And, you know, oh, wait a minute. Because if we did that, then we would have to seriously look at weaning ourselves off the dependence of foreign oil. And then maybe we could get serious about some of these other options, even the one that you've put out there that I don't really like, and that is nuclear power. But, you know, as long as we can keep getting gas and pumping it out of the ground and we can look the other way about humanitarian on humanitarian issues, then we can keep driving and keep our electric our prices down and our grocery store prices down because of all the things that are brought in on semis and, you know, diesel fuel and all that kind of stuff. And we don't have to worry about finding, you know, and I'm not even talking about protecting the environment. I'm just saying, if you wean yourselves off of fossil fuels, then you're not so dependent on these autocratic authoritarian governments who happen to have oil in their land or have land around them that has oil, which is one of the reasons why Putin wants certain regions in the Ukraine. I I do think it's important to note because some people may be questioning, you know, didn't we hear about some years ago that, you know, the United States was doing really well and producing almost enough oil for everything that we need? So why is why are oil prices a problem? Well, that's one of those globalization things, right? Um, because, you know, you're bringing it up, Lance, this whole idea of we're going to be back buying, you know, Russian oil. Well, it's not so much that the United States. Well, not so much States, us, right. It's that the world... Western Europe. For Western us. Europe in particular uh, is reliant on oil and natural gas from uh, Russia. So we actually produce probably somewhere around um, like 90% of what we need. 80, between 86 and 91% self-sufficient as of 2016. Well, and the other problem was when global, you talked about globalization, global oil prices went down. And so many U.S. companies quit pumping raw oil out of the ground here in the United States because it was not a cost effective for them because there was a oil glut out there. And so oil prices were driven down. So you weren't making money to pump the oil out. So we quit pumping oil. Okay, so now we can, people say, well, we can go back. And as we've talked about on other shows, that's going to take some time to do. You know, now that oil prices are predicted to maybe hit $150 a barrel, but at least over the next three to four months, average 112 a barrel from, you know, what was 50 or $60 a barrel. Now, if I have some capped oil wells out there, it would behoove me to, uncap those and start pumping because now I can start making money off of it, which means the United States can produce more oil now that the price is up, 
which doesn't necessarily alleviate gasoline prices. It just means that we won't run out. I would also return just to note, let people think about this here, Lance, as we head into the next segment. You had mentioned weaning ourselves off of the dependence of foreign oil. We collectively referring to the West, right? Yes. Um, Not just the United States, how, but the United States and all of our allies. However, I would go one step further and say weaning ourselves off of oil because I don't know if anybody has calculated, but I would like somebody to calculate the millions of lives that have been lost or in the case of Ukraine, have been disrupted in the name of oil, you know, because we have built a society that is so dependent on it. I mean, you want to talk about the way to shift the mood of the United States of America, the greatest power that the earth has ever seen, change the price of gasoline and you can shift the mood of a nation. And I don't know about you, but that's disturbing. That you could you could literally get the United States to go to war just because of the price of gasoline. That is a scary dependency in my mind, and it's one that I think this conflict highlights as a we may not only have we previously been willing to put our own people in harm's way in the name of acquiring oil. In this case, we're willing to let a democracy be invaded and taken over uh, because it might mean that if we let it get out of the way faster and we don't get too involved, then maybe we'll get our low gas prices back. Just think about that. Think about what, what really matters in the grand scheme of things. All right. Would peace be good? Let's find out. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. As Lance outlined at the end of the last segment, the possibility of peace, well, it's possible. There are a few sticking points, um, and that's a little facetious there. Um, the the points in fairness do require capitulation by Ukraine. They require capitulation by Putin. Uh, so I think from that standpoint, as we have talked about many times on this show, the nature of a a deal right being reached in a tense situation is usually one where everybody has to not get what they want. Um, and I think, as outlined by this article, in any of the realistic scenarios, everybody seeds. Um, my biggest concern, which Lance sort of hinted at last segment, is the longevity of whatever this might be. Um, my fear is that in seeding part of Ukraine to Putin, um, which is a probably for something to happen that's probably got to be part of the arrangement, right? Um, and the promise that the Ukraine doesn't join NATO. I, I think Putin will let Zelensky stay in power, which he said, which Putin said initially would not be allowed. He had to have regime change. Right. He and, seems to have gone silent on that. Right. So I think he'll let Zelensky stay as long as there's a promise that there's no joining of NATO. Right. The other thing, by the way, not to not to sidetrack too much, but I, I had been curious about because Lance and I've had little discussions about, um, you know, like I wanted to know, is it Kiev or Kiev? Is it the Ukraine or Ukraine? And I did a little more research to figure this out. And okay. it's a historical thing. So um, the reason that you he still hear some people say the Ukraine is because up until 1991, when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, it's longer name then. Um, which involved, you know, the People's Socialist Soviet Republic of the Ukraine. Um, Russia, well, at the time, the Soviet Union always referred to it as the Ukraine. And the West followed suit because in recognizing that the Soviet Union was a conglomeration of powers, the appropriate, quote unquote, appropriate statecraft was to just simply refer to that country as was by its proper name, but often shortened to just the Ukraine because saying that whole big long thing every time was not very what the united practical. united soviet socialist republic 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Saying that every time. USSR. Right. Uh, was and then in the case of you know Ukraine, you have to say all that and then the Ukraine. So that was cumbersome. So they shortened it to the Ukraine. Then in 1991, um, when Ukraine declared itself independent and later uh, had its own constitution uh, drafted, it dropped all of that and just refers to itself as Ukraine. Um, so I, there is. Look at you taking over the history portion. I know, show. right? Well, I, I can't take credit for just having known this. I was just curious because you had mentioned that, and I thought, okay, well, there's got to be a reason that some people want to say it one way versus the other. And the answer is, well, Lance was a, alive when it was the Ukraine, even though today, supposedly, it's supposed to just be Ukraine. Um, just like you were alive when it was Kiev, which is the more Russian pronunciation of it, which of course was the correct way to say it up until, up until, you know, Ukraine's like, yeah, we don't want to do it that way anymore. So there's your tidbit of history, I guess, for today that I, my curiosity got the better of me. Not that any of that particularly matters to peace, but. But back to your point about where could we see peace, right? Right. Where could we see peace? And the answer, um, the thing that I struggle with on the Putin front, Lance, of figuring out whether or not it could happen is, you know, because we're concerned about a repeat, right? Well, Putin stays in power, there's a repeat. If he accepts peace, right, he's going to be making a gamble that he can sell it as enough of a victory that he gets to stick around. I'm not sure, though, because that's a gamble, right? And I don't know if anybody, not even Putin, knows how that is going to play out. So let's say we accept this piece of, you know, you're going to get part of Ukraine, basically, by the way, the part that you've already controlled for the past 10 years, but whatever, you know, um, and you obviously get to keep Crimea um, and we're not going to join NATO, but we may join the European Union. Um, and, you know, the West is promising to protect us if this other happens again, which is a worthless promise because who says that we're going to keep that promise? Um, it's not a ratified, you know, treaty or alliance or anything like that. So, you know, but, but fine, you know, you do all that. Ukraine promises we're not going to put these types of weapons in Ukraine. Fine, fine, fine. And so we come to this whatever version of peace we have. I don't know if Putin can sell it as a big enough victory to stave off a regime change in Russia. I mean, I'm sure he'll try. I'm sure that he won't go down quietly. Um, but what I wonder is before he has the chance to do this all again, quietly behind the scenes in Russia over the next several years, do you start to see, uh, okay, you know, you were pounding your chest, you were telling us we had to do this. And basically you got a bunch of Russians killed and didn't actually get squat. I mean, because really not to downplay, you know, the negotiations, but you already had this part of Ukraine. You already didn't have Ukraine in NATO because NATO didn't want to anger you. So what exactly did you really gain here? I mean, again, from a material standpoint, I know you may get some official acknowledgments or whatever, but what did you really gain Russia, you know, that we didn't already have before you got a bunch of our people killed? What did we get? Um, and if you're an oligarch, I think that's a reasonable question. And also you caused me a lot of pain and suffering, you know, for, for again, it appears like no damn good reason. You know, you just did it, just you did it and we didn't really get anything. So that would be, I guess, where my mind's at, Lance, on. I'm not saying that's likely. I think there's a real possibility, though, that that may be an interesting part of the equation. Um, not to say that who comes after Putin will be any better. Who knows? Well, I, I think what will drive Ukraine to come to some kind of terms will be the West saying we need to stop this fight. And I, I think that the West will cede to Putin some things that Putin wants so Putin can claim victory. And both sides will regroup and we'll play this out again in another five years. I just don't feel like the world, if there is a peace negotiations here and there is some kind of peace, it's because the West can't stomach what it needs to do to stop Putin. Um, because if Putin has the, his way, in my opinion, they will continue to attack. They will eventually take Kiev and 
at that point, then a whole new scenario opens up and what will NATO and the United States all do? Um, and I know the United States is part of NATO. Don't, you don't need to let me know that. I got that. But the the point is. Are we? Okay. Um, well, look it up. And uh, no, no, Bradley no. Bradley can cut this I, out. I, I, no, I, I know that we are and being facetious, facetious with. All right. Um, I just, I just don't see either side. I think the sticking points are too strong. And if the Ukrainians want to negotiate after Kiev falls, Putin won't have any interest. So there has to be something done quickly, I think, for there to be a peace treaty. I think it has to come to conclusion sooner rather than later. And I would say like in the next couple of weeks, I hope I'm, I hope I'm wrong because I don't want the West, the Europeans, the United States to sell out the Ukrainian democracy just to placate Putin. I don't want to see them capitulate and do that because then all that's gone on has really been for naught. And, and I, and I think that's, that's wrong. So not that I don't want peace. Okay. But I don't think we're going to get peace where Russia pulls all the way back to its border and the, and Ukraine is allowed to join NATO. If that were the peace, I'd be all for it. Then, then I'm, then I'm going to support that. I don't think it's very likely for that to happen. I don't think Putin will pull the troops all the way back into Russia. And even if he were, he will then not, capitulate to allowing Ukraine to join NATO. But that's the piece I would accept. What do our listeners think? Send us an email, podcast at thestateofus.org. We'd like to hear from you. Why do we have this conversation today, Lance? Well, we had it because True Jade has a mission, and our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. We've had another one of those today. You don't have to agree with us, but hopefully it's been entertaining and educational. And you share it with your family and friends and your coworkers, and they say, well, this sounds like the kind of people I'd like to listen to and start my day with or end my day with or have lunch with. Tell them they can find us as a podcast on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts are found. State of Us is available every Tuesday and Thursday, first thing in the morning as a podcast. We're also heard on the weekends on AM and FM radio stations across the United States. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, uh, it, was a, it was a tight competition today, a lot of back and forth on no, – no capitulation was present between Justin or Lance. Do you, have a, do you have a count, Lance? Well, I had you with a late lead, and I tied it up in, in the, in the uh, top of the ninth. And, uh, but that's what I have, but I, I didn't start keeping track early on, so it was kind of from memory. So I will leave it to – I will capitulate to Bradley ah. making the decision. Ah. Very good, then. Very good. I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to producer extraordinaire Bradley Butch, and thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in thestateofus.org.